This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. I'll sometimes get an idea for a video and I really like it, but it's too short for its own video. So I've collected a few of them together into one video. So this is five interesting things. I guess it's a new format, potentially. So if you like it, I'll make more of them. Uh, if you don't, maybe I'll try it one more time because you know, you've got to give these things uh, more than one go. Anyway, here you go, five interesting things. Here's interesting thing number one, image stabilization. So if you record a video on your phone or on your camera and it comes out shaky, you can take the footage and load it into video editing software or you can upload it to YouTube and there'll be options to stabilize the footage. And the way the software does it, the way YouTube does it, is to analyze the footage frame by frame to work out how the camera must have been moving to create that shot. And then it tries to figure out how can we soften that movement. So there's some artificial intelligence involved with that. The interesting thing is that I got this phone recently, it's a Pixel 2. It has image stabilization built in, but the way the phone does it is different, I believe, to the way the software does it, the way it's done on YouTube. I don't think the phone analyzes the footage as it comes in to work out what's going on. Instead, I think it uses the sensors inside the phone. So the phone has a gyroscope inside and it has um, an accelerometer inside. Those sensors tell the phone about its orientation in space and how the phone is moving. So the camera should already know how it's moving. It shouldn't have to try and work it out by analyzing the footage. And I think I can prove that this is happening. So by attaching my phone to the outside of a box with the camera looking through a hole, I'm fixing the camera's position relative to the box, relative to the picture of the cat there. So no matter how I move the box around, the picture of the cat and the camera will remain fixed relative to each other. So when I hit record on this camera phone, the image going into the lens will be completely stable. It won't move even when I move the box. But if the camera attempts to stabilize the image based on the internal sensors telling it how the camera is moving, then we will see some erroneous stabilization. The stable image will actually become unstable. So let's, uh, let's give that a whirl. You'll notice as I rotate the box like this, the picture suddenly moves to one side and then when I stop, it kind of slowly settles back down to the middle. And you can kind of see how that would stabilize an image if the phone wasn't attached to a box. And uh, look, it works in uh, going up and down as well, like that. So the image kind of snaps to the top and the bottom to try and compensate for the motion. Something I wasn't expecting to see when I put this experiment together was that the camera also seems to compensate for rolling shutter. I've talked about rolling shutter in other videos, but basically, um, the sensor in a camera doesn't take an instantaneous picture. Uh, instead, it scans down the sensor like that. So if you've got uh, an object that's moving across your frame and the sensor is scanning down like that, you can see how the object would become slanted. That's called rolling shutter. And um, pretty much all digital cameras have it. It's very rare uh, to have a sensor that doesn't do that. Um, and so look, if I spin round really quickly like this, The, the picture of the cat becomes slanted. Goodness, wait, get your balance. <laughs> um, so the, the, the camera is compensating for that sideways motion that normally produces rolling shutter that, that slants the image. It's trying to unslant the image, but because the image is not moving, it ends up slanting the image the other way. Interesting thing number two, fig pollination. So a fig is a syconium, meaning its flowers are all pointing inwards. So you've got this outer shell and then all the flowers are pointing inwards, hidden inside there. So if all the flowers are hidden away, how are they pollinated? They're pollinated by a wasp, a particular kind of wasp called a fig wasp, creatively. And here's how it goes down. So you've actually got two types of fig 
male figs and female figs. What the wasp wants to do, wants to do, is get inside a male fig because that's a nice place to lay your eggs. It's safe in there. So the crazy thing is that um, you've got this tiny hole and that's, that's what the, the pregnant female fig wasp climbs through. But it's so small that the wasp loses bits of its body as it kind of shimmies through there. So some of its wings go, its antenna. Once it's inside, it lays its eggs and then it's trapped. It can't get out again. So it dies in there. And then the eggs hatch. So you've got a whole load of male and female wasps inside the fig. The first thing they do is mate with each other. So the female fig wasps are pregnant before they've even left the fig that they were born in. The male wasps then dig a hole out of the wasp for the females to get out of. The males are blind and flightless. So once they've done that, they die. Their work is done. They've already mated. They've dug a hole out for the females and then they're done. The pregnant females, now covered in pollen from inside the male fig, fly off to find another fig. But here's the thing, if the pregnant female wasp that's just left the male fig flies off and then burrows into another male fig, that's no good for the fig tree. What the fig tree wants, wants, is for the female pollen carrying pregnant wasp to burrow into a female fig where it will deposit its pollen and pollinate the flowers inside the female fig. But that's not good for the wasp because when a wasp burrows into a, f a female fig, it can't lay eggs, it just dies in there. It's the end of the line. So the fig tree has evolved for the male and female figs at that stage in their lives to look identical. It's potluck which one the wasp will burrow into. It's the female ones that we eat, the male ones aren't tasty. So you might be thinking, ah, so when I eat a fig, that crunchiness is because I'm crunching on dead wasps. It's actually not, the crunchiness is the seeds. And in fact, when a wasp dies inside a female fig, and actually that can happen several times, so you might have several wasps climb in there and die, um, the fig releases an enzyme that breaks down the body of the wasp to release those nutrients. The nutrients are then absorbed into the flesh of the fig. So in that sense, I guess you are eating dead wasps. But I mean, it, it, by that definition, whenever you eat vegetables, you're eating dead animals because when an animal dies, it fertilizes the ground but I suppose with a fig, it's a bit more direct. Interesting thing number three. Outside my window, just over the River Thames, there's the Tate and Lyle Sugar Factory, and it's got these two chimneys with spiral fins around the outside, and you may have seen that on chimneys before. There's a good reason for them to be there. So when air passes over a cylinder, it sets up this oscillation in the air downwind. It's called vortex shedding because it produces these alternating vortices that are spinning one way and then the other. And the reason you get this is because of fluid dynamics, like fluid dynamics is complicated, so you get vortex setting for complicated reasons, but, but there it is, it's, it's fluid dynamics. But the important thing is, if you've got this oscillation in the air, this backwards and forwards motion, well, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, Newton's third law. So the chimney must be feeling a side to side force as well, opposite to the force that the air is feeling. And that's okay, just make sure your chimney is sturdy enough to resist that side to side force. Except that the, the frequency of vortex shedding, like how quickly does it go back and forth is related to the wind speed. If you increase the wind speed, you increase the frequency of vortex shedding. What that means is, if by some bad luck, the wind speed is just right, you'll get the resonating frequency of your chimney. I've talked about resonating frequency before, but the important thing is, if you hit the resonating frequency of a system, the energy that you put in adds to the energy that's already there and the amplitude goes up dramatically. So suddenly your chimney's doing this. 
which is bad news. And I can illustrate this effect actually with an elastic band and a hairdryer. It's similar to when you put a blade of grass between your thumbs and blow through. You don't want that to happen to your chimney because it will fall over. So you put these fins around it and they direct the air downwards on one side, upwards on the other side. And that's enough to disrupt the flow of air to the point where you don't get vortex shedding. Interesting thing number four, lima beans. Lima bean plants have evolved this amazing defense against caterpillars. Basically, they call in the meta predator. Like, if you can find a way to summon your predator's predator, you might be able to survive an attack. And the meta predator in this case is a wasp, different wasp to the other one we were talking about. This one is a caterpillar wasp, obviously. And this one injects its eggs into caterpillars. So, um, you know, when you think of wasp, you think about uh, it's an insect that stings you. But I mean, that's a type of wasp. Another type is a wasp that uses its um, stinger to inject eggs into things, in this case, caterpillars. So the egg hatches inside the caterpillar, the newly hatched wasp eats the caterpillar from the inside out, and the caterpillar dies of that, obviously. So what the lima bean plant does is when a caterpillar comes along and bites into a leaf, that's detected chemically by the plant and it reacts by releasing a scent. And this scent is like an advert. It's like the signs outside the Krispy Kreme, you know, they, they light up when there are fresh donuts. It's like this scent is saying, hey, we've, we've got fresh caterpillars, come and get them. So the, the wasps fly on over and inject their eggs, the caterpillars die and the lima bean survives. It's amazing. And it's a coordinated thing as well. Like, one caterpillar takes a bite and the whole plant releases a scent and neighboring plants release the scent as well. It's really amazing. Interesting thing number five, tower of string. I built this tower of string sort of sculpture. So it's slightly mind bending because, you know, string isn't rigid, it's flexible, so it should fall over. And while this tower thing has rigid parts, these plastic bits are rigid, they're not attached to each other directly, they're attached via bits of string, and string is flexible. I mean, think about it for a bit, you can see how it works, like the, the bits of plastic are under tension and they're holding the string in tension as well. String is strong under tension, and that's what makes the tower stand, but still, it's a little bit mind-bending when you first look at it, which is fun. Thanks to Austin Engel for bringing that to my attention. He sent me a, uh, a picture of one that he'd seen on, uh, on Twitter, which inspired me to build my own. So there you go, five interesting things. One more bonus detail at the end of the video. But before that, I just want to say we've covered a few different topics in this video, biology, engineering, technology. If you want to learn more about those subjects and maybe learn in a more structured way, then I can recommend The Great Courses Plus. It's a subscription on-demand video learning service with great courses and lectures from top professors at Ivy League universities and other noble institutions from around the world. You get unlimited access to 9,000 video lectures about the subjects you find interesting, from engineering and biology to cooking and playing chess. I really recommend the course called do-it-yourself engineering because you can get your hands dirty as you're working through the course. You can build the things along at home with the professor, building them on screen. By the end, you'll be a really accomplished maker. Interesting fact for my UK viewers, The Great Courses Plus has always been optimized for the US, but it's now optimized for the UK as well and Australia. So there you go. They're offering a free trial right now for subscribers to my channel. So go to thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash Steve Mould or click on the link in the description and start your free trial today. Here's the bonus fact. It's about the fig wasps. A female fig can be pollinated by many female fig wasps. So you might have a few crawling in there with, their, with the pollen covered heads. And if you're a fig farmer, that's a problem because if too many of those internal flowers there get pollinated, then the fig bursts open 
and the figs are harder to sell, I guess, when they're burst open. So the farmers keep the male fig trees and the female fig trees completely separate. So there'll be two completely separate uh, plantations or orchards maybe. Um, and you know, the, the distance is too great for the wasps to just kind of find themselves um, crossing between the two. And so what the farmers then do is they, they collect the wasps from the male orchard and carry them over and just release exactly the right number that they want to, to perfectly fertilize the fig without it bursting. That's it, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thank you.